good day. In several programs that I've made for this channel, I have recently quoted that tag, sometimes attributed to the Greek playwright Euripides, that whom the gods destroy, they first make mad. Just consider the recent steps taken in the US-China relationship between the United States and uh, China over the issue of Taiwan and the completely unconnected issue of oil. Um, a week ago, just over a week ago, President Biden of the United States and President Xi Jinping of China had a virtual summit meeting. Over the course of that meeting, President Biden broached with President Xi his concerns about the um, increase in energy costs, and he appears to have tried to persuade President Xi to release part of China's strategic oil reserve alongside the United States in, in a concerted move with the United States and various other countries in a move to depress oil prices. This is, of course, very important for President Biden at this moment, because one of the, the major reasons why his poll ratings are falling in the United States, together with those of his administration, is because um, of rising inflation in the United States and, of course, the rise in oil prices. President Xi was sceptical, as is very clear from the Chinese readout, and, by the way, from subsequent commentaries that appeared in the Chinese media. He considers that the reason for the rise, the general rise in prices, the general rise in worldwide inflation, is the economic policies of the Biden administration in the United States. But he doesn't seem to have rejected the idea of releasing oil from China's strategic reserves in a concerted step with the United States and other countries. He doesn't appear to have rejected that outright. Well, over the course of the next few days, it's clear that the Chinese cooled to that idea. And when the United States did eventually release a limited amount of oil from its actually highly depleted strategic reserves, the Chinese made no coordinated move and the amounts of oil released by other countries were, as a result, token. I would say that when it comes to a concerted release of oil from strategic reserves, it is unrealistic to expect that other countries will join in if China does not do so. The Chinese are believed to have an enormous strategic reserve, but if they're not prepared to release significant amounts from it, then other countries see no point in doing so. And in fact, the amount that they released was, it was a token amount. Now, why do the Chinese, who do seem to have considered Biden's proposal, why did they eventually decide against doing it? Well, the short answer, of course, is that the United States, since that summit meeting, has taken a whole succession of steps which tweak the tail of the Chinese dragon. Firstly, we had all of those reports, completely untrue reports, as I discussed in a video that I did for this channel, that President Xi, over the course of that summit, had agreed with President Biden on some talks to, to discuss limits on China's nuclear strategic arsenal. As I pointed out, that was absolutely, definitely not the case. Those talks were mischievous and they provoked hostile and critical commentaries in the Chinese media. But then we've found that the United States, again, finds it impossible to stop scratching at that itch that China has, that particular issue that concerns China most of all, which is Taiwan. Firstly, you had what are in effect government to government talks between the United States and Taiwan over trade and economic policies. And this is not just ordinary trade agreements, by the way. It is about detailed strategies 
detailed um, economic strategic actions, such as, for example, resisting economic coercion, which begs the question of economic coercion by whom, which, uh, in which the United States again appears to be signalling its support for the authorities in Taiwan in their, um, in their conflict in their conflict, their face-off with China. And the State Department then on the 19th, on the 22nd of November, published what from the Chinese point of view, 19th of November, sorry, what from the Chinese point of view is an incredibly provocative statement. And it, it speaks about how uh, these economic talks, which are going to take place under which would take place under the auspices of AIT and Tecro, advance cooperation on a broad range of economic issues and forge closer economic and commercial ties between the United States and Taiwan. Our partnership is built on strong two-way trade and investment, people-to-people -people ties and in common defence of freedom and shared democratic values. And as I pointed out in a previous uh, programme, the words in common defence of freedom and shared democratic values, again, implies not just some sort of economic relationship, but an ideological alliance against whom precisely? Well, obviously China, because when one talks about common defence of freedom and shared democratic values, who is freedom and democratic values being defended against? Well, in respect of Taiwan, that must be China. So just days after Biden meets Xi, asks Xi's help, to release oil onto the world uh, uh, onto the world markets, and by the way, reaffirms the United States's commitment to the One China policy, accepting that Taiwan is an integral part of China. We see a statement released by the State Department, which in effect contradicts that. But annoying though that is, that is completely eclipsed by the latest information about this summit of democracies that the United States is convening together in, uh, in December. Because the United States has now released a list of who the participants in this meeting are going to be. And the, uh, the important thing to say is that some US allies, like Hungary, and Turkey are not included, nor is Singapore included, and of course China and Russia obviously are not included because they are clearly the designated adversaries. But what is really infuriating to the Chinese is that Taiwan is included. Taiwan is invited to this summit meeting for democracies, showing that the United States, in reality, does consider Taiwan an independent country, a democracy, an ally, an ally against China and Russia. And, of course, the Chinese, predictably, are extremely angry about this. And they have not hesitated to say so. And we've now had a, a strong article about this from Gro Global Times. And we have comments of this nature, Summit for Democracy, an anti-Chinese ideological clique, um, etc. And then the article goes on to say the Biden administration, in a highly dangerous and provocative manner, is turning the so-called Summit for Democracy into yet another small-sized ideology-driven ideology clique to contain China, and this surely won't fare well as the world is trying to work together 
in the post-pandemic era and needs solidarity more than ever, rather than using the so-called values to instigate confrontation and divergence. Shortly after the US State Department released an official partnership participant list to the Summit for Democracy on its website by listing the island of Taiwan among sovereign countries, which fully exposed that the true intention of the US is turning the summit into a platform to contain China. Officials of the Taiwan State Affairs Office of the Chinese People's Republic State Council and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs voiced strong opposition to this reckless move. Zhao Lixian, spokesperson of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, urged the United States to stop setting up the platform for secessionists in the Taiwan island and advocating for them as the United States will eventually get burned. And those are quotes from, as a quote from Zhao Lixian, the spokesman of the Chinese foreign ministry. And it's not difficult to understand that the Chinese are incredibly angry and the article goes on to say, listing the island of Taiwan among sovereign countries shows that this so-called democracy-themed summit uh, uh, um, is, is being turned into another ideologic, ideological-driven clique by excluding countries like China, Russia and Singapore, which have already explored their own paths of development of stable societies, the US, a country with concerning democratic declines, hosting the summit would only be a slap in the face as its own definition of democracy and authoritarianism can't fit in a rapidly evolving world world. And so the Chinese are angry about that and they also um, can sit, continue to complain bitterly about these moves. Well, for my part, I struggle to understand the logic of all of this. And I, I do wonder whether sometimes there are people in the United States, whether this is a divided administration or whether the people who are running this administration are, think that they are being clever when they are actually profoundly stupid. Is this a profoundly divided administration? in which President Biden, worried about his poll numbers and, and, and on the advice of his advisers, seeks to uh, um, downplay the Taiwan issue, establish closer relations or better relations with China so as to get China's cooperation to stabilise the world economy and to avoid conflict in the Pacific? If so then the best thing to do is to stop talking about Taiwan, in which case there are clearly divisions, because it's obvious that someone in the State Department, Tony Blinken for one, isn't getting the message, because on the contrary, they're going out of their way to provoke China by constantly bringing up the topic of Taiwan in that way. Or is it that the entire Biden administration is playing some sort of sophisticated double game with China, as they think, that they can come along and talk to China and give the Chinese the impression that they support the um, um, one China policy, that they accept that Taiwan is an um, integral part of China and gain China's cooperation on such things as releasing oil from its strategic reserves, whilst at the same time, when they're no longer talking to the Chinese, going ahead and pressing on with their policy of supporting Taiwan as the authorities in Taiwan take more and more steps towards um, um, seceding from China. In the first case, you have an utterly divided administration in which any policy of conciliation towards China is immediately uh, um, is immediately stamped on by the hardliners in the state in the State Department 
who remain obsessed with backing Taiwan. In the second case, it's even worse because you have a foreign policy of duplicity, telling the Chinese one thing to their face and doing the opposite when the Chinese aren't around. In the first case, the Chinese would decide that this is such a, uh, a divided administration that it makes no sense to try to work with it. In the second case, the Chinese will say to themselves, this is such a dishonest administration that there is no point in working with it. In either case, there is no possible way that US-China relations can actually improve. And I would say it's exactly the same with Russia. Biden comes along, picks up the telephone to Putin, tries to defuse tensions over Ukraine, or at least goes through the motions of trying to do so. And then the State Department comes along, Tony Blinken comes along, issues statements about the United States' rock-solid commitment to Ukraine, it, and, of course, the Defence Department uh, sells arms to Ukraine and that the Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin goes to Ukraine and talks about the day when one day Ukraine will be joining NATO. Again, the Russians must be saying to themselves, is this a divided administration or is it a dishonest one? But does it in the end actually matter? Because either way, it's an administration which we can't realistically deal with. We're not going to get any serious deal with them. Now, the Russians will play along with this sort of thing as they always do. And the reason they do that is because, of course, from their point of view, they're in a weaker position than China, they're a far less powerful country than China, and they would rather not have a war in Ukraine because from their point of view, the situation in Ukraine is working out pretty much as they see it in their favour. There's an economic crisis there. There's a political crisis there. The situation, there are already uh, um, comments criticising the Ukrainian president, President Zelensky. The uh, former Ukrainian prime minister, Yulia Tymoshenko, has again come out and criticised President uh, uh, Zelensky uh, by implication in comments which he's made on Ukrainian television, which I have just seen just before making this video, and in which, again, she seems to hint at the need for an improvement in relations with Russia. So the Russians don't want a war in Ukraine because they would have more to lose from a confrontation, a full-out confrontation with the United States. And besides, they feel that the situation in Ukraine is working in their favour. In Taiwan and with China, it's completely different. The Chinese are, feel themselves to be in a much stronger position vis-a-vis -vis the United States. China is a much more powerful country than Russia. It is 10 times Russia's population. It is a far bigger economy. It is central to the working of the world economy. And it has increasingly powerful armed forces. The Chinese come to this issue with, in a much more confident uh, uh, frame of mind than the, Russian, than the Russians do over Ukraine. But there is also another difference. Whilst the Russians have good reason to think that events on the ground in Ukraine are working out in their interests, so that they can afford to wait, with Taiwan it is different. Unlike U Ukraine, Taiwan is an economic success story, and with each passing day, as the administration, um, the current administration in Taiwan, consolidates, pro-independence sentiment in Taiwan becomes stronger. It is less likely that Taiwan will therefore one day decide to rejoin China um, voluntarily or as part of some sort of negotiation, especially given the encouragement 
the current authorities in Taiwan are receiving from the United States, which is encouraging them to pursue the policy of secession. So you have a situation in the Pacific where a far more powerful China than Russia, a more self-confident China than Russia, feels, unlike Russia in Ukraine, that time in Taiwan is not on its side. Given that that is so, the Chinese calculus, given the imperative to reunite Taiwan to China, the Chinese calculus is pushing China much more forcibly towards the kind of open military action to regain control of Taiwan that then that the, that the Russians at the moment are balking from doing with respect to Ukraine. So it is a different calculus, and in some ways, from a US point of view, a more dangerous one. And yet, I don't get the sense that anybody in the United States understands this. On the contrary, I get the impression that to the extent that the political class in Washington thinks about these things at all, they assume that the military crisis is more likely to come from Russia in Ukraine than it is from China over Taiwan. All the talk over the last couple of weeks has been about this Russian build-up um, on Ukraine's borders, a build-up which, as we know, is not actually taking place. The Russians have made it very clear that if there is a Ukrainian attack on the Donbass, they will launch a counteroffensive. But in reality, the dangers of a Russian offensive to reoccupy eastern Ukraine or to uh, extend Russian control into Ukraine, the, Russian, uh, the prospects of the Russians taking a preemptive or aggressive step in that, in that uh, um, respect, for the moment at least, are non-existent. By contrast, with respect to Taiwan, the possibility of China taking preemptive action to avert a Taiwan secession move is very real, with the Chinese feeling both stronger all the time, but also sensing the time in Taiwan is running out for them. Now, I don't get the sense, as I said, that people in the United States understand this at all. I don't get the sense that the administration, the, the people in the administration, certainly not the president's foreign policy team, people like Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken, I don't get the sense that they understand this at all. I think they think that with Taiwan, they can continue to pull the wool over China's eyes and the Chinese will just accept it. I, I think that is not just foolish and reckless, but frankly misguided to an unbelievably dangerous degree. It shows a misunderstanding of Chinese policy and of Chinese determination and decision-making, which could end and have with tragic results. Anyway, let me now finally revert to this question of the oil price release. And I say that this isn't perhaps exactly on topic, but it is connected with some of the things that I was uh, discussing um, at the earlier part of this programme. Uh, one reason why the Chinese did not agree, another reason why the Chinese did not agree to release oil on the international market, um, given that they must be extremely angry with the behaviour of the United States since the summer. It's not surprising, but of course it also makes very little economic sense anyway. And um, there's an article about this in the Daily Telegraph in Britain by Ambrose Evans Pritchard. Now he's a conservative, British conservative commentator, but he was an outspoken supporter of Joe Biden, 
uh, during the presidential election last year. And he was also something of a supporter of Biden and of Biden's economic policies at the start of this year. He's now completely changed his tune, but he's now writing about why the oil price situation is as it is. And I will read out some of his article. I should say that it is behind a paywall, so I won't read it all. And the article says it is hard to keep give to hard to keep giving Joe Biden the benefit of the doubt. The emergency release of oil stocks from the United States Strategic Petroleum Reserve this week violates every rule of statecraft and market arrangement management. To borrow from Napoleon, if you say you're going to take Vienna, take Vienna. The White House has just succeeded in driving up the price of crude oil in a bungled attempt to do the opposite. A release of 50 million barrels with double counting is barely 12 hours of global consumption and too small to swing a giant complex market. Uh, Washington now has a bigger problem in its hands. Oil market bulls are stirring because they have seen Mr. Biden play and waste a useful card. The deterrent value of the petroleum reserve has been reduced. Ole Hansen from Saxo Bank said the reserve is nearing the 90-day floor needed to cover severe supply shocks. The US has been selling decent chunks for weeks. The market knows they'll struggle to repeat this and they now look naked. The Petroleum Reserve was created in 1975 after the OPEC oil embargo to cope with disruptions of supply, but there is no such disruption today. The US Energy Information Agency itself says the market is in healthy balance. Crude prices have risen, but are not particularly high. Brent is hovering around $80 a barrel, far below sustained levels near $100 from 2011 to 2014, let alone the $148 peak in mid-2008. Oil is flowing smoothly and trading close to its long-term historical average in real terms. What America does face is near record fuel prices at the pump, though nothing like the supply shock of the 1970s, an era when gas guzzlers were half as efficient. Petrol has jumped 50% since January to $3.50 a gallon, still tame in UK terms, with the blame increasingly being laid at the floor of the White House. And he, the the article the uh, article from um, um, Amber, I Ambrose Groves Pritchard that goes on to say, as in the early nineteen seventies, the underlying cause of U.S. cost inflation is the printing press of the Federal Reserve. The output gap in the U.S. economy has officially closed. There is no longer slack in the economy. Capacity complaints, constraints are visible everywhere. The jobs quit rate used to track tightness in the lab, in the used to track tightness in the labour market has never been so high. The Atlanta F Fed's instant tracker of uh, GDP growth for the fourth quarter is running at a blistering to 8.2 percent. Yet the Powell Fed is still injecting stimulus, having already gunned the broad M3 money by 30% since the start of the pandemic. It continues to purchase over $100 billion of bonds each month and continues to hold interest rates at zero. That is why inflation has soared to a 30-year high of 6.2%, accelerating to an annualized 10% percent rate last month. Monetarists warned a year ago that the Fed was pouring rocket fuel on dry timber and that prices would catch fire 
once the economy reopened. Professor Tim Congdon from the Institute of International Monetary Research uh, said then that the crushing evidence of monetary history is that money creation on such a scale would prove highly infl inflationary. It was the same message from the Centre for Financial Stability in New York, and they were ignored. Now, I would add that Jerome Powell, the Fed Secretary, has just been reappointed to that position by President Biden. So here we see, and we come back to the point that Xi Jinping made to Joe Biden over the course of that summit meeting. There is no point in releasing oil onto the world market from strategic reserves, given that the money produced production in the United States continues to, to uh, glow red hot, creating worldwide inflation. The only effect of, of um, releasing large quantities of strategic reserves would be that it would cause oil prices to dip temporarily, but before very long, along with inflation elsewhere, they would start to go up again. That is indisputably true. But if you add to that actions over Taiwan that are calculated to infuriate China and to hasten the day when there is going to be a war in the Pacific region, between as China moves to squash independence moves on Taiwan, well, how can you realistically expect China in that kind of situation to come to your help? As I said before, this administration is its its policy at so many levels is baffling. Whether it is divided between realists and ideologues, or whether it is duplicitous, in a sense, as I said, it doesn't really matter. The effect is the same. More confrontation coming down the line, together with a total collapse of trust. Well, thank you for joining me again for this programme. I look forward to you joining me again to soon in future programmes on this channel. Please also remember to check out our main channel, The Duran, where I do programmes with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforou. And please also remember to join us um, on Locals, where we now have a thriving community and where um, I, we post exclusive content and where, by the way, I now regularly do live streams um, every Wednesday. So you can join us on Locals if you want to interact with me. You're very welcome. You can do it there. At the, um, we're also, of course, on other platforms as well, on BitChute, on Library, on Odyssey, on the new free, free speech platform, SuperU, and on Rumble, which has now, of course, uh, come into joined Locals in partnership. And if you want to support us, you can support us via Patreon and subscribe star, and also by coming to our shop. You will see that on Thanksgiving weekend, I have my magic mug with the US flag, but you will find lots of other magic flags there too, magic mugs there too. And of course, we have our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, and all the rest. And if you've liked this video, please remember to press the like button. And if you, uh, 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 and can I also ask you as well to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. I look forward to you joining me again soon and have a wonderful day until then.